The purpose of this video is to give you some guidelines and walk you through the process for completing worksheet number one. Typically, in a standard class, we will do a lot in the class and work on it together. That's not an option with the online course, so this video is to provide some guidance for you. Now, the worksheet that you see is going to be very similar to the one that we're going over here, but there are some differences, particularly on problem number one. So learn the principles, but then apply them uh, appropriately for the problem. So for instance, on 1C, the dates that you're going to have are different, but the principles that we're going to be going over are the same. Okay, so most of this you should have gotten in the lecture. Hopefully this is a review. If not, well, that'll be good for you to help you to complete the worksheet. So we're looking at a diagram here. This is a little cartoon diagram of stratigraphy. Every little band represents a different type or a layer of rock. And we have sedimentary rocks, which are laid down at the bottom of lakes, oceans, rivers. And we have igneous rocks, which are molten lava, magma, that then cools and becomes rock. So those are two very different types of rock. We could possibly also have metamorphic rock, but we're not going to deal with that complication in this worksheet. Okay. So why are there no fossil records, no fossils discovered in rock layer D? So that has to do with the type of rock, okay? So think about why you wouldn't have fossils in molten lava in igneous rock. Part B, 1B, which of the sedimentary rocks is the most ancient and how do you know? This is a very simple process of st stratigraphy and this is nice and easy because geological processes have not interrupted these layers. That happens sometimes where you can see them kind of have being shifted and moved and broken, but over large areas of time, you will still see this general pattern. And of course, because of the way sedimentation works, the layers on the bottom are the oldest, right? You can't lay down uh, older sedimentary layers um, on top of younger ones, right? It just doesn't work. So we lay down layer C first, maybe then the oceans recede, and then there's maybe even millions of years intervening, and then another lake or ocean comes into that area, and we get sedimentary layer B. And so, although they don't need to be um, one right after the other, sometimes they are. But certainly the ones on the bottom are older than anything above it, okay? So with that given, we've got this kind of, and this is an artificial setup in Part C, because in reality, a graduate student would, would know much more and would never make this mistake. But there's a mistake here, and let's see if we can figure it out. Layer A is trying to be directly dated. So a sample of the sedimentary lock rock was taken to be directly dated. Now hopefully that raises some alarms in your head. We cannot directly date a sedimentary rock because it is made of components that are much older, that's dust, wind, dead animals, um, all of the things that are settling down to the bottom of an ocean. And those things that are settling down are a mishmash of all different ages. And so even if we could accurately date those individual components, we would not have any indication of when the rock layer itself formed because that's a separate event. So when we try to directly take a date from a sedimentary rock, it's untrustworthy. So notice we have three dates here, layers A, B, and C, that we try to take from sedimentary rocks. So you cannot trust those dates. It just doesn't work. However, because igneous rock all forms at one time and we have methodologies to, to figure out their dates, we can trust dates from sedimentary rocks. So this is kind of the catch-22, or paradox, if you will, of trying to date fossils. We have lots of fossils in sedimentary rocks, but we cannot directly date them. We don't have any fossils in igneous rocks, but we can directly date those. And so we have to put those two pieces of the puzzle together to get our best dates for our fossils. Okay, so these follow-up questions we kind of already answered, right? So radioactive dates, are they reliable? Your answer should be well for A, B, and C. They're not because they're sedimentary rocks and we can't directly date sedimentary rocks. So given that reliability, how can we get a best date? Now notice that fish fossils appear in layers C and B, but there aren't any fish fossils in layer A. And turtle fossils appear all the way through the rocks and layers, but we don't see any um, turtles in today's uh, environment. It's a fossil species only. So given that, we can, although not very precisely, we can, with some accuracy, date our uh, fossil fish and fossil turtles. So let's see what we can do with that. And again, your dates are going to be different, so just apply these principles to your 
a problem. So we can trust that 20 million years old. So the question then is, did the fish species go extinct before or after this lava flow came through, which was 20 million years ago? Now notice there are no fish at all in the layers that are laid down on top of the lava flow. But the lava flow interrupts layers that were, so they were already there when the lava flow came through, and those layers have fish in them. So those fish must have gone extinct longer, you know, they're, the, those fish fossils are older than 20 million years. So your best date, given these, and again, your dates are going to be different, but the best evidence we have for when the fish species went extinct is more than 20 million years ago. <laughs> I automatically changed my greater than sign. You put something like that, more than 20 million years ago, okay? Given the reliability of the dates above, when did the turtle species go extinct? Now again, we know that it had to gone extinct less than 20 million years ago. So we could do like this. And that's the best that we can do, right? Maybe it was 5 million years ago. Maybe it was 19 million years ago. Maybe it was yesterday. We don't know, but it's not found today. Uh, and it's found in rocks that are younger than 20 million years. But that's the best we can do. Now, in real life, scientists look for many igneous events spread out over large areas, and this is particularly easy to do. Well, it's possible to do for many, many rocks because they, ex they extend over thousands of square miles across the bottoms of oceans. And so if we can recognize those rocks in very different places with different igneous events, we can get more and more precise or narrow windows for our fossil dates. With this one, we only have one, so it's not very precise. But in reality, we might have multiple igneous layers that help us get a better and smaller window for different uh, sedimentary rocks. Okay, So part D, a member of the research group finds a non-fossilized, and that's critical. So remember with fossils, we have very little, or in reality for most fossils, none of the original organic material. So living organisms are made up of four primary molecules. We've got carbohydrates, we have nucleic acids, we have lipids, which are fats and, and related molecules, and then we have uh, proteins, amino acids. Those things, all, some, although quite stable and in good conditions, can last sometimes for hundreds of thousands or even a million years. After that, they're really all gone. And so in fossils, all those original molecules at the molecular label, at the molecular level, they've been replaced by minerals. Now, at the um, supramolecular level, I guess above molecule structure level, there's still a lot of detail preserved. So we can see bones and sometimes even soft tissue if it's really good preservation. But it's a mineral preservation of the original organic material. So we cannot take a fossil and take a sample of it and directly date it. However, if we still have non-fossilized organic material there, we can do that. Okay. Now I'm going to give you a hint. You can look this up. The key is radioactive decay of carbon. So look that up, and we talked about it in the lecture just a little bit, but look it up, and, and there is a major limitation, and that is has to do, I'll give you a hint, with the half-life of radioactive carbon. So do a little work on that. If you have questions, you can log into one of our um, Zoom sessions, Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 7 p.m., or you can make an appointment to meet with me via Zoom, uh, and we can go over that. Okay, so that's problem number one. Problem number two, what is the ultimate source of all energy that powers your cells in 99.9, .9, more than 99.9% .9 of all life on Earth? Where does the energy come from? Now, if you think about yourself, you're saying, well, I eat food. Okay, great, but where did the energy in that food come from? And if you're eating a plant, it's kind of obvious, right? So if you're eating uh, an apple, right, all of that energy, the carbohydrates in that apple and all the other things too, by the way, were powered by, generated by photosynthesis. Then you say, okay, wait, but I'm going to eat a cow, right? Cows aren't powered by photosynthesis. But where did the energy in the cow cells come from? Well, cows ate plants. Plants ate, not ate, plants got their energy from the sun. So this is just very simple. You can say the sun or um, photosynthesis. Sun via photosynthesis, whatever you want to say. Now, there's a very, very small percentage of organisms that can get their energy via other chemical reactions down at the bottom of oceans in extreme environments, but that's rare. Vast majority of life on Earth gets its um, energy one way or another from photosynthesis. Okay, so when did this process evolve? Look that up or go back over the lecture. 
So now realize there's a, a disconnect here. Photosynthesis evolves much earlier than what we call the great oxygenation event, when free oxygen begins to accumulate in the atmosphere, right? And then you need to look at why there was such a long delay between when photosynthesis originated and when we start to see appreciable levels of oxygen in the environment, okay? Again, that was in the lecture. I don't want to just give it away here, but think about it. If you're having trouble, go back over that lecture, or you can Google it, look it up. You'll, you'll find it. Sometimes Google's an incredible resource, but one of the issues with Google is there's so much that sometimes finding the specific answer you want can be a little tricky. If you're still having problems, send me an email or log on during one of those Zoom sessions. Okay, problems number three uh, through seven. This is dealing with phylogenetics. So these are in... Um, the Tuesday and Wednesday lectures for the, this week, the, the week that the worksheet is due. Uh, so you can go over those. If you haven't done them yet, then you maybe want to wait a little bit, but uh, you can pause the video and come back to it. But here's what we're going to do. So we need to look at characteristics that might help us distinguish and define relationships between these organisms. And I could have picked any organisms. I tried to pick ones that hopefully you're at least a little bit familiar with. If I had picked genera of sea slugs, you might have a little bit more of a problem thinking about characteristics. You'd have to become an expert or at least do some research. So uh, you can use the expertise that you have to fill out this matrix. And honestly, I don't care for the purposes of this exercise what characteristics you look for. So if you want to, ca to take character number one is, have I eaten it? Now, that's probably not a good relation, a good characteristic for defining relationships of organisms. It's a trivial character. It doesn't tell us any, have any deeper meaning about what the organisms are. But for the purposes of this exercise, that will work. So I've eaten chicken. I've eaten plat, no, I'm sorry, I haven't eaten platypus. Um, I haven't eaten kangaroo. I don't think I've eaten cat. Maybe I have without knowing it, but and oops so that let's say maybe i have let's say i'd, I'd eaten a cat one point or, or somebody served me cat and i didn't know it um, but anyway and i've uh, not eaten sea lion okay so now we have a character with a simple binary definition either it is or it isn't and if you want to put check minus or sorry check x or plus minus or a b whatever it is as long as you have a binary character here that works fine so have i eaten it um, I now have a chicken and a cat that have a distinct feature that's different than the rest. Now, again, that's probably a bad character, but for the purpose of this exercise, I'll, I'll accept however you want to code these. So I'll let you pick your own characters. I'm just going to do one more and let you try to think. Now, it's probably useful for you to think of, of things that would be biologically informative, but if you want to stick with trivial ones, again, as long as you're able to figure out how those characters uh, distinguish your your relationships I'm okay with that for this exercise okay so let's try and pick a biologically relevant one for this next one let's say um, does it lay eggs so maybe even more specifically external eggs and I'm gonna be a little bit more technical amniotic eggs which means they have a membrane within them that allows them not to dry out but they're external, right? They're, they're not kept internally in the body. So in this one, I would say the chicken, right, has external eggs. You eat them all the time. Platypus, it does also. They lay eggs. The kangaroo does not lay eggs. So we're going to say zero, zero, and zero. Okay, so now I have two characteristics, and I'm going to map these onto the phylogeny. Now, in Word, it's a little awkward, but it works okay. If you would rather draw these out and then take a picture and upload it as a JPEG, that works fine, too. Remember, there are only three formats that I accept for worksheets because otherwise it's too difficult to convert and, and do them. You need to have them in Word, the original format, in a PDF if that works better for you. Or you can take a picture as long as it's in a JPEG form. It's a universal form. And you can take pictures of the entire worksheet from your phone and upload those or scan them. I don't know, whatever works. Word is usually the easiest. It's a little clunky, but I'll show you how to do it. So the chicken and the cat are the same. Using a principle of parsimony, we are going to try and map this character number one on there. And to do that, I'm going to go to insert, shape. We'll just pick a simple square. Now, notice the chicken and the cat in this phylogeny are very separate from one another. The simplest way to define, and I'll just use copy and paste for the next one, 
why they have a similar characteristic is it must have evolved two separate times. And I'm going to put these bars, maybe it's a little large, let's make that actually a little bit smaller. Just for convenience sake here. Okay, I'm going to put bars across the phylogeny representing changes in where they occurred. And I can put it anywhere after the cat broke off from the sea lion in this phylogeny. So what I'm saying is that this feature of have I eaten it, which is really a silly feature, but, you know, we're doing phylogenies, uh, had to have evolved separately different times. And that's because the chicken and the cat are distantly related in this phylogeny. Now, could I assume that the not eating it characteristic evolved uh, three times separately, and so I could mar mark it here? And that could happen. There's really no orientation to the zeros or the one. They're just useful designations. So I could say three. But remember our principle of parsimony. If everything is treated, treated equally, marking it on there three times is not as good as just marking it twice. So we would just put it on twice. And now by doing that, I've separated the cat and the chicken via these bars from everything else on the phylogeny. Now, there is one other way that is equally good to map this characteristic. And this gets a little bit more complex, but it illustrates an, important, an important point for farther down. So notice the way I've mapped this. I've mapped it as a convergence, that the character evolved separately and independently two different times. That's the definition of convergence. It's not homologous, because homologous is when it happens once and then people or species inherit it. But convergence is one way to mark this. But there's an equally parsimonious way if I put this right here. And what I'm saying is that the ancestor will just, we can assume whatever character state we want for the ancestor. The ancestor was good to eat, but then that characteristic was lost. And as these lineages separate, break off, they inherit that lost characteristic, not good to eat. But then the cat regains it. Now, this is a little different. It's equally parsimonious, and so it doesn't matter for the purposes of determining what, if the phylogeny is good or not, whether we say it happened convergently or it happened as a, let me grab that again there, as a symplesiomorphy, which is it happened once in the ancestor, was lost in some of the descendants, but then another descendant regained it. So this is a symplesiomorphy, a characteristic that was gained, not good to eat, and then lost, good to eat. Okay. So either way works, but they're different in uh, looking at the history of the organisms and how these characters evolve. So with all this data, we wouldn't be able to distinguish between them, and either one would work. So now notice for this next one, we could do the same thing. So I'm just going to copy both of these. We'll just do it twice. And for this next phylogeny, I do the same thing. I mark it as a convergence, or I can mark it as a symplesiomorphy. Doesn't matter. However, I want to do it. Okay. Now, using character number one, we don't have any way to distinguish these two phylogenies. This one has a length or a cost of two. This one has a length or a cost of two also. So character number one didn't help us distinguish them. And that's actually okay for this exercise. In real life, we'd like to have some characters that give us differences so we can distinguish phylogenies from each other. But for the purposes of this exercise, it doesn't matter as long as you map them correctly. Okay, so let's do character number two. I'm going to use a different color for it just so we can distinguish it. In fact, to help me keep track, um, and this is good, you want to mark this somehow, I'm going to put a little indicator that character number one is that blue square. I'm going to take and paste in another square here, and let's make that one um, shape format. Uh, let's make this one red. You know, do the outline red, whatever you want to do, as long as you can distinguish them. So in this one, I have chicken and the platypus that are the same. Okay, now notice that I can mark this as a convergence, that the chicken and the platypus gain the ability to, oops, let's paste that red one. Uh, the chicken and the platypus gain the ability to lay eggs separately. But is there a simpler way that I can do it? Now, remember, I can assume the ancestor at any character state I want. I don't need to mark the ancestral state. So by simply putting it right here, chicken and platypus, and then getting rid of this one, I can in one place separate the egg layers from the non-egg layers just by putting that bar across that ancestral lineage right there. 
So that represents a transition from an ancestral egg-laying state to not laying eggs. And that is the most parsimonious way. If you can put a character on there once, that's always the best way to do it. So that's great. Let's do the other phylogeny. Maybe. So notice that I can't, there's not any bar that I can put across here to say, oh, this happened at one time. So I either need to mark it. In fact, I think there's only one way to do this one. We'll take a look at it here. I need to mark it as convergence, right? Happened separately in the chicken and the platypus because there's no line I can draw across any of these lineages to separate the chicken and the platypus from all the other species. Because in this one, the kangaroo is closely related to the platypus. Now, I could mark it as two losses, and so either way would work, whether I want to put it as gaining of egg laying here or as a loss of laying eggs in the kangaroo and a loss of laying eggs in the ancestor of the sea lion and the cat. And because those are both two evolutionary instances, whether I do it as convergence, again, like this, or as a convergence of loss of that character. This would both be convergence, but we're gaining egg laying in that one and assuming the ancestors didn't lay eggs. In this one, we assume the ancestors lay eggs and we lose the ability convergently. That happens twice. So either one's convergence. And again, for the purposes of deciding which phylogeny is better, it doesn't matter which way you do it. But notice now something that we now have a distinguishing, a distinguishing feature between these two um, phylogenies. This one assumes three evolutionary events, which is more parsimonious, a simpler explanation than this set of relationships, which has to assume four evolutionary events. Okay, and again, we'll put my little uh, indicator up here in number two, just so I can keep them, keep trap of them. So if I was done here, and you've been asked to do four more characteristics, whatever you want, if you want to look them up, if you want to make them up even, I don't really care as long as you map them correctly and then distinguish between the two phylogenies. If you can't distinguish, that's a, uh, you can get full credit for that also. You need to say they're equally parsimonious, and I can't distinguish between the two. So using a parsimony criterion, which phylogeny is the best hypothesis about relationships? With just this simple matrix, the one on the left is the best because it's a simpler explanation. Okay, there are or you could say there are fewer evolutionary events to separate the, uh, the relationships among these species. Okay. Um, so number five, these are just, I kind of want you to think uh, and use these definitions and apply them to a group that you're familiar with, the mammals, a physical feature that is a synapomorphy. Now, I'm not going to give you this answer, but let's review the definition of synapomorphy so you can think of one. A synapomorphy is a character that is inherited from the common ancestor and defines the group. Now, a little hint here, many groups, including mammalia, are named for a synapomorphy. And sometimes there are many, sometimes there are not that many, but for this group, there are actually multiple synapomorphies that define mammalia. So one of them is the, the character for which mammalia is named. Okay, that's a hint. Okay, a physical feature that is a symplesiomorphy for the group mammalia. And this one's a little trickier. I'll give you this answer, but I want to talk you through it first. A symplesiomorphy is a characteristic that begins potentially as a, as a synapomorphy. It's an ancestral characteristic, but then some of the descendants lose that characteristic. So it's no longer a defining characteristic of um, the mammals. Now, you could say walking on four legs. Now, in reality, that's not the best choice because walking on four legs is not really the, it didn't occur in the ancestor of the mammals. It actually originated much more anciently in the ancestor of all of the tetrapod vertebrates. So I will accept that and won't count off for it, but it's a little bit of a weaker choice than maybe some others. So let's look at another one. Now, if I chose uh, having hair over your entire body, that might be a much better one because the ancestor of all the mammals had hair pretty much covering its entire body. And some mammals, including humans to some extent, whales, hippopotamus, elephants, other many mammal groups have lost that defining feature that once defined every mammal. So that would maybe be a better choice. Another one that's commonly used is complex teeth, you know, where you've got your front teeth, middle teeth, and back teeth that have different shapes. That's something that seems to have originated in the early mammal ancestor, and other organisms don't really have that. And then some groups, including um, dolphins, uh, have lost those complex teeth, so pretty much all of their teeth are the same. So complex teeth might be another good symplesiomorphy for the mammals. Okay. Now, 
Symplesiomorphy is a great thing that causes homoplasy. And homoplasy is what we did up here with the blue or the red character, but only on the second tree here. So the blue character on both trees and the red character here on uh, the tree on the right. A symplesiomor I'm sorry, a homoplasy is when we have to map a characteristic in a complex manner. Instead of just mapping it on there once for a binary character, we have to put it on there twice or sometimes even three or four times. That's homoplasy. And there are two things that cause homoplasy. So symplesiomorphy, which is what I have mapped here, right, in the blue character, it was gained, uh, the ability to hold your eggs internally was gained in the ancestor of all of these. I'm sorry, this was not the egg laying characteristic. This was the um, uh, eating characteristic. T being tasty, like Dr. Terry likes to eat you, evolved in the ancestor of all these and then was lost in the cat. Or I guess, sorry, I'm going to have to look at the um, orientation of this. Uh, being tasty was lost there. That would be a loss of being tasty and then a regain of being tasty here again. That's a silly characteristic, but if we picked a more biologically relevant one, it would make more sense. But notice that is a symplesiomorphy. It was that it happened in the ancestor and then was reversed in one of the descendants, but not these three descendants. So that is symplesiomorphy, and it makes homoplasy because I have to map it on there twice. Now, if I had, and again, this is equally valid for the process of determining which tree is better, if I had mapped it like this, that is no longer a symplesiomorphy because all these ancestral nodes don't have any changes. It was only in the nodes leading to the, the lineages leading to the chicken and the cat. And so this is something else, right? What is it called when we gain a characteristic different, separately in two different lineages? And that is the second source of homoplasy. Now notice it looks similar. We have the bands, the bars in different places, but it looks similar to symplesiomorphy where I had to map it twice versus this one. I'll let you look that up. We talked about it in, earlier when I was looking at it. What's that called when we gain two features independently? That's the second source of homoplasy. All right, that's worksheet number one. Again, if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them and go over them again. Log on to a Zoom session or email me and make an appointment and we can go over it.